Hello, my name is Elizabeth Fitzgerald. I am an Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Emergency Medicine and Director of Pediatric Global Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And today I'm going to be talking to you about maternal and child health in acute care settings in low and middle income countries. The goals and objectives for this talk are to briefly discuss maternal mortality worldwide, understand the trends in global pediatric mortality and the leading causes of death in children worldwide, provide a brief overview of neonatal resuscitation, and introduce ETAT, which is the emergency triage assessment and treatment tool, the most common approach to the acute care of children in LMICs. And lastly, to be able to assess and manage a child's airway, breathing, circulation, coma, convulsions, and severe dehydration in a low resource setting. First, some general, oversticks, oh, general statistics on maternal mortality with the caveat that I am a pediatrician and do not ever take care of pregnant women. And so I believe this will be covered more in depth in another um, lecture series. <clears throat> but just as a general overdue, overview, Every day in 2020, almost 800 women died from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth, and that was one death approximately every two minutes in 2020. The good news is that the maternal mortality ratio, which is the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 live births, has dropped by about 34% worldwide since 1990. And yet still, almost 95% of all maternal deaths occurred in low- and middle-income countries in 2020. <clears throat> the major complications that account for nearly 75% of these deaths are severe bleeding, usually after childbirth, infections, also usually after childbirth, high blood pressure during pregnancy, either preeclampsia or eclampsia, complications from delivery, and unsafe abortions. <coughs> And you can see on this graph, this is data, data from um, 2023 from the World Health Organization. And you can see that overall maternal mortality remains very, very high in some African countries. <clears throat> but in general, um, it is better and lower in the Western countries. Pediatric mortality has also significantly declined since 1990. And we measure pediatric mortality by looking at three separate figures. So neo the neonatal mortality rate is usually looking at the number of deaths per thousand live births in, of infants ages zero to 27 days. The infant mortality, mortality rate looks at the number of deaths per thousand live births between birth and 11 months. And the childhood mortality rate looks at the number of deaths per thousand live births in under five-year-olds. The mortality rates are generally declining worldwide. And this is a graph that really demonstrates this. So you can see on the left is an image of overall neonatal mortality rate in 1976, where the vast majority of the developing nations in the world had extremely high mortality rates. And you can compare that to 2023, <coughs> where they remain much lower. Infant mortality rates have also declined from a high of about 65 per thousand live births down to about 25 000 per thousand live births. And the under five mortality rate in 1990 versus 2023 is about a third. So it went from 93 to 38. And you can see that overall mortality remains high on the African content, continent and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> when you look at why children are dying worldwide, you can see that it's largely due to infectious causes. So this is a study This is that was published in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health in 2022 that looked at 5.3 million deaths in children under five worldwide and examined what the global, regional, and national causes were. And among children ages one to 59 months, mortality was primarily attributed to lower respiratory tract infections. And this used to be called pneumonia, <clears throat> diarrhea, malaria, and injuries. 
And altogether, these four categories accounted for almost 60% of deaths in this age group. In this graph, which is also from WHO data, <clears throat> looks at the causes of death in 2019 and divides it into neonatal causes of death and death in old, older children. So again, deaths in children um, under 28 days, about 46% of overall under five deaths were in this group. And the majority <clears throat> are due to preterm birth complications or intrapartum related events. Congenital abnormalities also play a large role in, in mortality in this age group. And when you look at children ages 1 to 59 months, <clears throat> which accounted for 54% of those 5 million children, the majority remain infectious causes. So lower respiratory tract infections accounted for about 10%, malaria for almost 8%, and diarrheal illnesses about 8.5%. This graph from that same study looks at how um, mortality has changed in the last 19 years. And you can see that the global decrease in under five mortality is primarily attributable, attributable to decreases in the number of deaths caused by diarrhea, lower respiratory tract infections, preterm birth complications, neonatal intrapartum related events, malaria, and measles. So changes in these few causes constituted 63% of the total reduction in under five mortality from, 20, from 2000 to 2019. So switching gears a little bit, I wanna talk about how you can take care of children in the developing world if this is um, part of your mission. <clears throat> and so first, the most important thing I think is to prepare for your site. So no matter where you're going, you should try in advance to learn about your site. So learn about the culture, culture and history of the country if you can. Certainly read about the local epidemiology of disease. Try to learn about and understand the healthcare system and bring resources with you. So to the left of this slide is a picture of the pocket handbook, the hospital care for children that is published by the World Health Organization. And just about everything that I discuss in the following slides can be found in this handbook that you can bring with you. <clears throat> I also recommend finding and, and familiarizing yourself with lo local protocols if they're available. Usually these are evidence-based and often um, government-derived and they can really help you to make sure that you're maintaining the local standard of care. And then when you get to your site, make sure that you spend some time shadowing someone local if that's possible. On a very pragmatic level, understand where supplies are kept and what's available. Learn about available ancillary services. Is it possible to get labs and which ones? Are radiology studies possible? Can you get a CT scan? And if these, these um, modalities are not available on the site that you're working at, are they available at other sites? And how can you avail yourself of them? And then understand the availability of local con consultants. Are there subspecialists or specialists available who can help you if you get stuck? And then it's very important to learn about what the different health cotters are at your site and what roles the different individuals play. Um, not everyone is familiar with mid-levels, such as nurse practitioners or physician assistants, but they may have clinical officers or nurses or nursing assistants. And it's important that you understand where you fit into the local system. And above all, never be afraid to ask questions or to use your resources. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about neonatal resuscitation. And so again, this is if you find yourself um, with a newborn infant. So if you are in a delivery and you are with a newborn infant, the first and most important thing to do is to dry the infant immediately with a clean cloth and to try to keep the infant warm and covered. You want to look first at how the baby is doing. So you want to look to see if the baby is breathing or crying and if they have good muscle tone and vigorous movements. If they do, the baby is well and you can proceed with routine care. If the baby is not breathing or crying or does not have good tone or look vigorous, then you should stimulate by rubbing the back of the baby two to three times. You should not suction the baby's mouth unless there was meconium stained fluid or the mouth or nose is obviously full of secretions. 
after rubbing the baby's back for a few times, if the baby continues to not breathe or to gasp or have low tone, call for help. If there's a newborn resuscitation area, try to move the infant there. And then make sure that you're positioning the head and the neck of the infant slightly extended. If you have it, you can start positive pressure ventilation with a mask and a self-inflating bag and try to do this within a minute. You want to make sure that the chest is moving adequately. You can do this for about 30 to 60 seconds, and then you should check the infant's heart rate, ideally with a stethoscope. If the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, then you should proceed with chest compressions until the heart rate is above 100. You should give more oxygen than the baby had already been put on, if, if available. And if the heart rate remains below 60 after um, a minute of chest compressions, then you can consider other ventilatory support, IV adrenaline, and refer where possible. And if there is no heart rate for more than 10 minutes, or if it remains less than 60 for 20 minutes, then you should discontinue care. If after 30 seconds of stimulation, when you check the heart rate, if it's greater than 60, <clears throat> you look to see if it's between 60 and 100. If it's between 60 and 100, you can try to ventilate the baby at 40 breaths per minute and consider a higher oxygen concentration than a nasal cannula, suction if necessary, and continue to reassess. If the heart rate is above 100 per minute, then just continue to ventil ventilate the baby at 40 breaths per minute. Every one to two minutes, stop to see if the baby is breathing spontaneously and stop ventilating when the respiratory rate reaches greater than 30 breaths per minute. And while it's important to understand each of the steps in this process, you do not need to memorize them. This is in that hospital care um, handbook that I advocated for in the first slides. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about emergency triage assessment and treatment. So this is how you take care of kids in an acute care setting in low and middle income countries who present to you acutely ill. So the majority of pediatric inpatient deaths worldwide occur in the first 24 hours. The WHO developed these guidelines adapted from PALS to help even lay people rapidly identify children with immediately life-threatening conditions. It was developed in Malawi and has been field tested multiple times in many countries and again is contained in the manual The Pocketbook of Hospital Care for Children. And really, the goals of ETAT are first to triage all children when they arrive at a healthcare facility into one of three categories, those with emergency signs, those with priority signs, and those who are non-urgent. Um, the first step will be to assess the child's airway and breathing and give emergency treatments, then assess the child's circulation status and level of consciousness, manage shock, coma, and convulsions in a child, and assess and manage severe dehydration in a child with diarrhea. Also very important is to be able to identify severe malnutrition and manage it appropriately. So triage with ETAT can be taught to just about anyone and a good triage can occur in as few as 20 seconds in a well child. So the thought with this is that if there's a large crowd of children or mothers with children gathered at an assessment area that you should be able to walk along the line of moms with their children, unwrap the babies and the children to look at them and be able to triage them appropriately into their categories. And the word triage means sorting. So patients are placed into categories, either emergency, priority, or queue, based on whether they have emergency or priority signs. And again, ETEC can be used anywhere by anyone who's had training and should occur immediately upon arrival of the child. So emergency signs, which we're going to go over in detail, are related to airway, breathing, circulation, coma, convulsion, and severe dehydration. If a patient has any of these, they should be treated immediately. And then if the patient does not have any emergency signs, then the clinician assesses per priority signs, which include tiny baby, temperature, trauma, pain, poisoning, pallor, respiratory distress, restlessness, urgent referral, malnutrition, edema, or burns. And the um, acronym 3TPR-MOB can help you remember that. And these children, if they have any of these signs, should move to the front of the queue. If a child does not have emergency or priority signs, they can go to the back of, it, back of the queue and wait to be seen. This slide, we're going to look at um, 
airway, breathing, and circulation, and then the second slide looks more at coma, coma convulsions and severe dehydration. So starting with airway, I just want to give a shout out to my colleagues at Kamuzu Central Hospital in Lalongwe, Malawi, who took a lot of the information from the pediatric handbook and adapted them to create their own ETEC guidelines. Um, and many of the slides that I'm using are from their um, adaptations. <clears throat> So when assessing a child's airway, the most important thing is to first look, listen, and feel. So you are looking to see if the child is breathing adequately. It is an emergency if there's no chest movement, no air movement, any cyanosis, or any strider. And you can help if you notice any of these things to reposition to open the airway, remembering that for an infant less than one year, you want to keep them in a neutral position, but a child greater than one year, you want to put in the sniffing position. Always remember the possibility of trauma and remember to stabilize the neck and do a jaw thrust. If you find that an airway is obstructed and the baby or infant is choking, then you can do either back slaps or the Heimlich maneuver until the object is removed. If the airway is not completely obstructed, but is, air movement is poor, um, you can suction secretions if suction is available, and then you can place a guidel or nasopharyngeal airway if there's an obstruction from the tongue or upper airway. So in choosing an upper, upper airway, just remember these should only be used in unconscious patients to improve airway opening. And when you're trying to choose a size, you wanna measure from either the corner of the mouth to the earlobe, or from the center of the incisors to the angle of the jaw when laid on the child's face with the raised curved side up. To insert an oral airway, in an infant, you're gonna do it convex side up in one movement, and in an older child greater than a year, you're going to insert it concave side up and then turn it around. And just remember in a lot of these settings, there's no way to intubate a patient. So you're gonna be using a lot more of your adjunct airways and um, other methods to try and improve, to improve um, breathing and um, airways of, of children. So again, looking um, at breathing in a child, you're going to be assessing for severe respiratory distress, and you're going to be doing that by looking, listening, and feeling. And you can see this picture of a child um, who's in severe respiratory distress. You can see severe lower chest wall retractions, fast breathing. If it's an infant, the baby will be unable to eat or breastfeed because they're having so much trouble breathing, head bobbing, grunting, or restlessness. And should these occur, you should place the child on oxygen. In neonates, the goal is between half and one liter per minute. In an infant, one month to 12 months, it should be one to two liters per minute. In a child, it should be two to four liters per minute. If they're still hypoxic or still having severe work of breathing, you can consider CPAP. I put here to monitor oxygen saturation, but that may not be possible depending on your setting. Uh, oftentimes you can buy little pulse oxes from CVS or Walmart and bring them with you. They can be challenging to measure on children, but they, if you can do it, can be helpful. If the child only has respiratory distress, you want to keep their SATs above 90%. If they have other emergency signs such as shock or coma convulsion, you want them to be greater than 94%. And then if breathing stops or is ineffective, you can ventilate using a bag valve mask. And the rate would be for infants, one breath every two to three seconds, and for a child, one breath every three to four seconds. This is just an overview of the different sources of oxygen that you might have in different settings. So on the top right, you can see an oxygen concentrator. And an oxygen concentrator is a great machine that requires electricity but never runs out and it turn, turns room air into 85 to 100 percent FiO2 using a nitrogen absorbing agent. It can typically deliver anywhere from 2 to 10 liters per minute but is often used on a splitter which you can see in the picture on the bottom. An FiO2 tank or an oxygen tank up on the top left can deliver up to 15 liters of 100% oxygen per minute. It doesn't require electricity, but it's very expensive and runs out. Splitters can be used with both forms of oxygen source, um, and they basically help 
to use one concentrator or one tank for multiple children, but you just have to, you know, kind of take into account that you won't be able to deliver the flow or the FIO2 that you would if you were only using it for one patient. And then obviously the most common kind of oxygen delivery is going to be a nasal cannula. And this is a picture from the WHO handbook of a nasal cannula properly positioned and secured. You can also use face masks, CPAP, and very, very rarely intubation. So this is just two different kinds of masks that you might um, encounter in different settings. And so the simple face mask on the left is capable of delivering about 50 to 60% FiO2 to the patient and needs about five to six liters per minute of oxygen flow. The mask on the right has a re reservoir bag and that can deliver up to 98 to 100% FiO2, requires a 10 to 15 liter per minute oxygen flow. And again, a lot of times the equipment that you're gonna be using is gonna be um, donations or things that people have brought with them. So you'd want to take some time to familiarize yourself with what's available before you have an emergency. This is a reminder of when you're using a bag valve mask on a child that you want to use the appropriate size. Often I would find myself you know, choosing from a pile of bag valve masks. They're certainly not like labeled and sized. So you want to make sure that the um, the mask that you choose is not too large, as in number two, where it kind of goes over the baby's chin, or too small, as in number three, where it's under the baby's nose, or again, too large, where it overlaps the baby's eyes and kind of covers the whole face. The picture on the far left, number one, is how the bag valve mask should look. Our, um, circulate, oops. Moving back to our circulation algorithm, once you've decided that the child is in shock, you want to assess for malnutrition because whether or not the child is malnour malnourished will really help you to decide whether or what algorithm to use. In all cases, you should treat chalk in the same with some of the same basic ways. So if the child is bleeding, stop the bleeding. Always place the child on oxygen. Obtain IV access. And if you can't get an IV in five minutes, then you want to place an IO. And when you're getting access, you'd like to try to get samples. Um, ideally, a random blood sugar or you know, a blood glucose level would be great. And then a hemoglobin, those are probably going to be the most useful things. But it's always good to know whether, what other labs are available at your setting. Always keep the child warm. And then give fluids according to the appropriate fluid plan, which we're going to go over. If the child did not meet the criteria of having all three signs of poor perfusion, then they might not be in shock, but they have impaired circulation. And that's not an emergency, but you treat it as a priority, and you're going to give either oral or IV maintenance fluids and reassess. So you can see in our algorithm that it's very important that we're able to assess for malnutrition in children. And so this slide talks a little bit about malnutrition in children. And there's generally two types that you'll see. So the first, which you can see the picture on the left, is marasmus, or severe wasting. And these children just don't have any muscle or fat, and they're sort of obviously malnourished. And then quashiorca is the other type of um, malnutrition that you might encounter. And this is protein energy malnutrition, and it's in an edematous form. And to assess for this, you're going to look at the child's feet and look for bilateral pitting edema of the feet. It's really important to comment here that malnourished children tend to look lethargic and severely dehydrated. They tend to have sunken eyes and delayed skin pinch. It's really easy to overestimate their degree of dehydration or shock, but rapid infusion of fluids can put them into heart failure. So you've got to be careful. And they're also often hypothermic and co-infected, including having undiagnosed HIV or TB. So after you've assessed that the child has is in shock, assess for malnutrition, and then as we mentioned, the next sort of critical skill that you'll need if you can't obtain an IV is to obtain an intraosseous line. So I just wanted to go over this a little quickly to remind you. So the first choice for the puncture is the proximal tibia. Um, actually, I should say first, contraindications to an IO are any infection at the intended puncture site, a fracture of the bone, and that's a relative contraindication. Um, and that, again, the first choice for your puncture is the proximal tibia. 
you want to insert the needle on the anterior medial surface of the tibia, about one to two centimeters below the tibial tuberosity. So in bigger kids, it's going to be about two finger breaths, and in infants, it's going to be about one finger breath. You can use what you have in terms of needles. I've used 16 gauge needles. I've used you know, 21 gauge needles, whatever you can find. Um, if you are unable to use the tibia, an alternative site is the distal femur, two centimeters above the lateral condyle. And after you've inserted the IO, you wanna make sure you aspirate about a cc or two of the marrow contents to be sure that it looks like blood and you're in the right place. And then you want to infuse, you want to flush the needle with 5 ml of infusion solution. And then always be sure to secure your IO line so that you don't lose it. So now I'm briefly going to go through some of the different algorithms for shock with some of the different conditions. So the first and most important one is shock and severe malnutrition. So again, it's really important that malnourished children have all three signs of shock, cold hands and delayed cap refill and a fast and weak pulse when you decide to treat them for shock. Again, you're going to always keep them warm, place them on oxygen, establish access, and check a random blood sugar. If you are unable to check a random blood sugar, you may just choose to go ahead and give glucose automatically, especially if the child is lethargic or unconscious. If the child is fully conscious, do not give IV fluids. It's always better to give resuscitative fluids to malnourished children by PO or NG tube. If the child is obtunded, lethargic, or unconscious, then you can give fluids IV or IO. The choice of fluids is not normal saline, or lactated ringers, but ringers lactate with 5% dextrose or half normal saline with 5% dextrose. And you're gonna give 15 mLs per kilo over 60 minutes. The most important part of this is that you monitor the patient's heart rate and respiratory rate every five minutes during infusion. So if you notice that the heart rate and respiratory rate are going up, then you need to stop the infusion. The child is likely in heart failure, and you can always give a little bit of Lasix. If there's no change in the, there's no increase in the heart rate or respiratory rate, you can continue to give the, trans, the, the fluids or may even consider a blood transfusion. And if the heart rate and respiratory rate are decreasing, that means the child's improving and you can move to maintenance fluids. In general, for trauma, it's very hard to get blood in a lot of um, low resource countries. So there's a couple of things on these algorithms that I wanted to point out. And the first is that you can consider tranexamic acid given either IV or IO, 15 milligrams per kilo. Um, and then again, they recommend giving whole blood 10 milligrams per kilo if available over 20 minutes, reevaluate and give another 10 per kilo. And this likely has to do with um, not having a lot of blood available. Um, if you do not have blood, they recommend repeated 10 ml per kg boluses of isotonic fl uh, fluids, either normal saline or ringer's lactate. With shock and severe anemia, so anemia is considered either a hemoglobin less than four or a hemoglobin between four and six with danger signs or shock. So if you see a low hemoglobin, or even if you're unable to get a hemoglobin from a patient, but you note severe pallor um, and signs of shock, then you want to group and cross match for blood urgently. But again, this can take time and sometimes it's not available. And so the question is, if you have a child in shock, do you proceed with giving resuscitative fluids? And they, unless the child is losing blood from a trauma, they recommend giving only maintenance fluid while awaiting blood. Once the blood arrives, you can give 20 mLs per kilo over three to four hours, making sure that you're monitoring vital signs and looking for signs of, vi of volume overload. But although you may be tempted, don't give big boluses of fluids if, to a child who is severely anemic and in shock. So after you've assessed for airway, breathing, and circulation, we move on to coma. And they, um, the ETAT algorithm recommends that you use AVPU. So is the child alert, responsive to voice, responsive to pain, or unresponsive? And if any of these are, if, if the child is unresponsive, it is an emergency. So protect the airway, place the patient in recovery position, suction secretions, give oxygen, consider the oral airway. 
You can assess for hypoglycemia doing a random blood sugar, but again, if you don't have that available, you can just give um, glucose. Uh, so a, a low blood sugar is different if a child is malnourished versus well-nourished. So an RBS less than 45 is considered hypoglycemia in a well-nourished child, but less than 54 in a malnourished child. And you can treat hypoglycemia with the rule of 50s, right? So 5 mLs per kg of D10 or 10 mLs per kg of D5. If you're unable to get an IV or an IO, you can place one teaspoon of moistened sugar under the child's tongue. Convulsions in the developing world. Um, so you can assess them, and I think most people know what convulsions look like, looking for abnormal repetitive movements, increased tone, eye deviation, or facial twitching. Again, always protect the airway. Place the patient in the recovery position. If you can, do, you can suction the patient or consider a nasopharyngeal airway. Monitor O2, put the patient on oxygen. Consider a bag valve mask ventilation if the seizure is prolonged. Always check the random blood sugar and treat or treat hypoglycemia um, empirically. And then the first line treatment for a convulsing child, um, according to the ETAT algorithm, is with diazepam. And you can give it rectally or IV. The doses are on this slide and can also be found in the WHO pocketbook. If the ch child continues to convulse after 10 minutes, you can give a second dose of diazepam. We really do not give peraldehyde anymore. And if they continue to convulse after 10 more minutes, you can consider phenobarbital or phenytoin, depending on what's available. Of note, neonates less than two weeks should not have diazepam. You should only get phenobarb. And always monitor for respiratory depression. And lastly, on our emergency signs, would be assessing for severe dehydration. So you're looking for children who have severe diarrhea in any two of the following signs, either sunken eyes, delayed skin pinch, takes longer than two seconds to go back, lethargy or disinterest in the inability to drink PO. If the child has some signs of dehydration, but not two of them, um, then it's not really an emergency, but they are not well. So you want to try to give oral rehydration solutions um, at the rate listed on the table on the left. So 75 mLs per kg of ORS over four hours. If the child is well nourished, and so if you determine that the child has severe dehydration, you want to look and see if they're well nourished or malnourished again. If they're well nourished, then you go to what's called Plan C, and you're going to give IV fluids isotonic saline, either normal saline or Ringer's lactate. In infants less than one year, you give 30 mLs per kg over one hour, so a little bit slower, and then 70 mLs per kg over five hours. If the child is greater than one year, you give that same 30 mLs per kg, but a little faster over 30 minutes, and then 70 mLs per kg over two and a half hours. And as soon as they're able to drink, you want to transition them to oral rehydration solutions. If they're breastfeeding, they can continue breastfeeding on demand. If the child has severe acute malnutrition, you would really, unless the child's in shock, and this child you've deemed is not to have shock, but just to be severely dehydrated with severe acute malnutrition, you want to give either oral or NG2 fluids, so do not give IV fluids. Resimol is the special oral rehydration solution that is made for malnourished children, and that's the only kind that should be used. And you can see the rates here, 5 mLs per kg every 30 minutes for times 4, and then alternating Resimol with a specialized formula for malnourished kids. And again, these amounts aren't so important to know because you can always reference them. But the concept that a severely malnourished child who's severely dehydrated should not get eye fluid, IV fluids is the most important one. And then last, if you've assessed your children and you've deemed them not to have any of the emergency signs, then you want to look for priority signs. So going through these tiny baby makes sense. It is um, less, you know, less than two month old. They, are, they should be seen right away. Temperature is usually a high fever. Um, trauma, usually it's obvious by history, but you always want to consider head and abdominal injuries in children. Severe pain always should be treated promptly. 
poisoning. Again, you'll usually know by history, but it could be a child with altered mental status. And keep in mind that organophosphate poisoning is not uncommon in this setting. Pallor. So with pallor, you're going to be looking at the child's tongue, gums, and palms, and comparing the palms of the child to those of the mother. Respiratory distress. This is not as severe as in our emergency signs, but present. And it takes practice to recognize when there's respiratory distress and when it's severe. So it's better to overcall it and consider it an emergency sign if you're unsure. Restless children are irritable and don't console. And that can be a sign of meningitis or occult trauma. Malnutrition, so severe malnutrition without shock, should take priority. Um, edema should be measured by looking at the child's foot, feet and pressing on the top of their feet. And if they have bilateral um, pedal edema, that could be related to malnutrition or untreated kidney or cardiac diseases. And then children with burns can deteriorate quickly. So again, um, I think the most important takeaways from this lecture are to make sure that you have good resources when you go. Try to know as much about your site before you go or as soon as you arrive as possible. And to never be afraid to ask questions and to use your resources. And thank you very much for listening to my talk. And um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.